Thank you very much for having me today. Um, my name is Elena Tadosi. Thank you very much for introducing me. Um, I'm part of the Open University. I'm doing my PhD there. And luckily enough, I applied for a PhD in the subject that I feel very passionate about, the right to die with dignity. And this is the title of what I'm going to be covering today. A little bit about the points that I'll be covering. I'm not going to go through them because I'm going to um, go into more depth anyway. So I'll, I'll get straight to it. In England and Wales, Section 2.1 of the uh, Suicide Act prohibits assisted in suicide. And it triggers an offence um, that you can get uh, 14 years imprisonment for. One of the latest, most notable cases that challenged this legislation was the case of Nicholson, in which um, there was a request for a declaration of incompatibility of Section 2 with Article 8, Private and Family Life of um, the European Convention on Human Rights. Of the nine Supreme Court judges, only Lady Hale and Lord Kerr were prepared to declare an incompatibility or to make a declaration of incompatibility uh, on this point because the section did not provide for any exceptions. However, the other judicial opinions were that A, Parliament was better suited to deal with this issue and B, it was not appropriate for the court to deal with the claim at that point before Parliament was given the opportunity to actually consider this issue. And these are the words of Lord Neuberger. Since this judgment, the Parliament defeated um, an assisted dying bill in 2015 by 330 to 118 votes. So according to Lord Neuberger's words, it is institutionally appropriate to now consider the question of compatibility. The latest House of Lords assisted dying debate observed that relaxing legislation in any way would present a risk. In Nicholson, Lady Hale said that the legitimate aim of protecting the vulnerable under this legislation does not justify a universal ban. In her ladyship's opinion, it is more than possible for a legal system to develop a way of identifying those particular individuals who should benefit from the exception and receive assistance uh, that they need. So what I am about to explore will show that the current system is flawed. On one hand, it does not prevent assistance in suicide, and two, it fails to protect the vulnerable that are meant to be protected under legislation. In 2009, the Director of Public Prosecution published a set of guidelines. I will call it the DPP policy. It helps prosecutors decide whether to bring proceedings against an offender, and the authorization for this is given only where there is sufficient evidence that the offense was committed and only in situations where um, is in the public interest. And the public interest rationale is based on factors um, both in favor of and against prosecution. Importantly, compassion was introduced as part of the factors, um, but this was welcomed by some, especially as many cases may be based, so the act may be based in compassion for giving the assistance in the first place. But since then, 138 cases had been referred to the Crown Prosecution Service, and of these, three cases of assisted attempted suicide have been successful. However, at any given time, these, um, the accuracy of these statistics are not necessarily so accurate. The merits of prosecution were questioned by Lord Neuberger in, in the case of Nicholson. He said that investigation of assistance in suicide after the event 
to establish if the act was based in compassion, does far less than a system whereby a judge or an independent assessor would attest the individual's uh, voluntary, clear, settled, and informed decision to die, of a wish to die, before the event. So in his view, preparing one's suicide in a professional manner would provide a higher level of protection for the weak and the vulnerable. Under the present regime, however, even where the assistance is minimal in nature, investigations can last for months. And this is a time while the, the loved ones await to figure out whether or not they're going to be prosecuted. In Nicklinson, the DPP confirmed that only one prosecution, obviously at that time in 2014, only one prosecution had been successful. But the case was extreme in that it involved a defendant giving petrol and a lighter to a vulnerable individual with suicidal intent, and they suffered severe burns. They also confirmed that by looking at Dignitas' website and establishing that between 1998 and 2011, 215 individuals had used the service, those who provided the assistance and accompanied the loved ones to travel abroad were routinely not prosecuted. Now, the DPP policy had been criticized for failing to protect the vulnerable. And one of these um, examples is the case whereby a pharmacist was said to be wrongly accused to have murdered his father. The defendant, Bipin Desai, also the son of the victim, claimed this, his father had suffered a natural death. After becoming aware that there was a need for a post-mortem, his submission changed. He admitted stealing medicine, which he then gave his father into a morphine fruit smoothie, and he said he did it out of mercy and compassion. Also, he knew that the medicine would depress respiration and would send his father into a deep sleep, followed by death. He finally injected his father with um, insulin to hasten the already inevitable end. In his decision, the judge said that for the deceased, being assisted to die was a blessing. The defendant was given nine months custody sentence, which was suspended for nine months. But, while I accept this particular decision, I also accept the possibility that a vulnerable individual in similar circumstances may consume a similar smoothie against their will. And as the number of assisted suicide cases or offenses rise, the number of arrests falls. So the message to the public is moving towards one of acceptance of assisted suicide with compassion, possibly available without prosecution. However, the existence of compassion is difficult to ascertain, especially where you only have the witness who is also the offender as the case was in, in, with Bipin Desai, where only the defendant and the victim had knowledge of the act. So, we have self-determined individuals being impeded from being able to end their life, or choose so, in their own country, for fear of prosecution, of course. While this might be avoided, if you help someone to travel abroad for a hastened death. 
A different example is the decision of the DPP not to prosecute Dr. Irwin for helping Raymond Good Kelvin end his life by helping him with money to travel to Dignitas. The type of help was distinguished in that prosecuting a healthcare professional, as evidence uh, indicated in the case, would be more likely if the patient was in his or her care, which was not the case here. Therefore, the lack of proximity was the key factor governing the question on prosecution. But the evidence for Bipin Desai showed a clear relation of proximity and dependency even between the defendant and the victim. But both decisions show conflicting justifying factors. And even so, in both instances, the alleged offenders remain free. Now, at the end of last year, Dignitas had, and I'm sure these are not going to be um, accurate this year, there were 1,315 members from the UK with 34 individuals having ended their lives in 2017. Since 2002, there have been 394 uh, accompanied suicides. Again, this might not be true after May the 2nd, if I remember correctly. However, it is not so simple for people to join. The process needs to be secret. After all, there is always the risk of prosecution. Dignity in Dying, an organization campaigning for change of legislation across the UK, criticized the country for outsourcing death to Dignitas. In a 2017, um, the British Social Attitudes established the existence of a broad support of change of legislation, with 77% of people being favor, in favor of some type of euthanasia. The average cost of traveling to Dignitas is 10,000 pounds. Now even so, 43% of people said they would consider this option. Sadly, a 2017 report found that 68% of the UK population have less than 10,000 pounds in savings. So Dignitas, considered a safe and secure avenue, is only an option for the rich. Which is not true. I'm sorry. I'm from Dignitas, and these costs which Dignity in Dying is spreading is false and not correct. Dignitas is a non-profit organization, and we can make reduction and exemption. If need be, we do the assisted dying for free. And I'm very much shocked that you're copying false information as an academic from an organization which is spreading false information about us. Okay, so, so this the, is where we later, please. But I will answer this one just for so that you don't, I'm not ignoring it, definitely. So I am with you, okay? If there is a fence, I am on your side of the fence. And as much as I consider it correctly to say it is not 10,000 pounds, I don't think that dignity in dying have used the 10,000 pounds to say, this is how much it costs you want to go. I think what they're using the numbers for is to highlight the need for people to be aware that there is a cost involved. I know, and I have, unfortunately, um, you know, I, I'm not covering the bits that I would find very interesting in that way in my paper. So, I'm sorry to, to have had you been offended by the 10,000 pounds. I know of so many cases where Dignitas has made so many changes so that they help people that need the help and, and forego any costs that are involved. So I am aware of those. I am definitely not ignorant. But they are using this to say there are flight costs. There are other arrangements to be made. And I don't think that Dignitas will actually fund that for people to actually travel to Dignitas. Um, 
it happened in this example that I've just used, and, and this is again for me to highlight and make my points. Uh, this is what academics do, unfortunately. They only use the information that supports their, their evidence. And um, again, the hate bit is, uh, I also have a, a law background, so sue me. But I mean it in the nicest of ways, I can assure you. So I am going to move on, otherwise someone is going to time me out. <laughs> But um, we can, of course, have a very interesting chat, I suppose, and uh, I, I can give you my email address and then you can tell me all the bad things <laughs> if you've got anything bad to say about, uh, yeah. Or, or, you know, I've got cards for everyone else that if, they, if you've got bad things to say about it. Uh, so as I was saying, um, a, a report has said that 68% of the UK population have less than £10,000, which is very true, at least this. Right, so the practicality of choosing Dignitas, if you don't like the money side, let's make it practical. It means that the person might have or might need to have an earlier death. And this means um, less time with family and friends. All of this because individuals are unable to access a safe way of achieving this at home. Research shows that since uh, between 2005 and 2013, of the total number of suicides, 332 individuals had a terminal illness. If the numbers are true, and as an academic, of course, I've um, not faked them. <laughs> this is not fake news. But I, I argue that the numbers that they have used of areas was quite small. So that's why I'm saying if the numbers are true, this would make it an average of 37 deaths compared to 23 per year at Dignitas. Now concerns for protection of the vulnerable have grown, especially after a recent inquiry into hundreds of questionable deaths as soon as June of this year. The investigation conducted by an independent panel revealed that between 1987 and 2001, the lives of over 650 patients were shortened by inappropriate administration of opioid analgesics. Importantly, most of these patients were not admitted for terminal care. The chair of the panel said that Gosport Hospital disregarded human life and promoted a culture of shortening lives by prescribing and administering dangerous doses of medication not clinically indicated or justified. In reality, this practice has been questioned by nurses since 1991. So even without access to, a, to empirical data, this shows that it is possible to practice euthanasia in hospitals without it being public knowledge. Now at the beginning of my presentation, I said that the framework is flawed in that it does not prevent acts of assisted suicide and it fails to protect the vulnerable. But the Parliament still claims that relaxing the legislation in any way presents a risk. Yet, the low number of successful prosecutions may already fail to discourage those willing to assist a loved one. So without a robust, professional and transparent system, amateur assistance can make matters worse. I do expect that this presentation shows that England and Wales does need a change. And as Lord Newberger said, the ideal, the ideal system attests to the individual's voluntary, clear, settled and informed wish to die while pr protecting the vulnerable, as opposed to inquiring into the, witness, into the wishes of silent victims in the aftermath. Thank you very much. <laughs>